The name Bugatti conjures up visions of racing excellence and of luxurious classic automobiles that are larger than life. They're cars that fetch multi-million dollar bids at auction. They've won races and stolen the hearts of auto lovers around the world. They were fast, they were beautiful, and they were expensive. Today, they are legends. A classic Bugatti Royale from the 1930s, like this one, sold for $20 million in 1997, the largest sum ever paid for a car at auction. Only six Royales were ever produced. These over-the-top regal cars were the dream of one man, Ettore Bugatti. Everything that Bugatti made had style. He was obsessed with creating things that were unique. He wasn't afraid to be different. Bugatti's passion for creating beautiful objects was stirred by his family of avant-garde European artists. I think there is a, um, a very good chance that there was some sort of uh, genetic uh, quality or, or characteristic in the Bugatti family that produced this series of uh, people with extraordinary aesthetic abilities uh, over a period of um, almost a hundred years uh, encompassing three generations and four individuals. Ettore's DNA propelled him to create some of the most stunning cars ever built. Cars that are poured over by design students, researched by automotive historians, and lusted after by wealthy collectors and vintage racers. Even today's manufacturers hope to recapture a bit of the Bugatti magic. This legend began in the late 19th century. Ettore Bugatti came of age in the 1890s, when cars were first being seen on European streets. Only the wealthiest citizens had cars. This was true in Bugatti's hometown, Milan. But he was transfixed by their possibilities. He wanted to be part of the emerging motoring age. But his father, the renowned furniture designer Carlo Bugatti, thought his son should raise his sights higher and become an artist. Ettore's younger brother, Rembrandt, was showing his talent as a sculptor. Rembrandt's skilled renditions of animals would earn him praise and representation in a Paris gallery. Ettore tried to please his father and also become a sculptor, but his heart told him that this was not where he belonged. Ettore apparently did not have a great deal of confidence. He perceived that his brother Rembrandt was a greater artist, so he decided to leave the traditional art form, painting, sculpture, to his brother Rembrandt, and he sought some other outlet, some other way to express his artistic talents and interests. In 1898, when he was just 17 years old, Bugatti decided to follow his own dream, automobiles. He plunged into motorsports. He had to start at the bottom. Ettore bought a, um, a tricycle what we would think of as an oversized children's tricycle, a Prunetti and Stucchi. And it had an engine on the rear axle driving the two back wheels. And uh, Ettore decided to take it apart, learn how everything worked, put it back together, and he won a few races. Unhappy with its performance and confident that he could do better, Ettore modified his motorized tricycle. Like so many others, he decided he could improve the design. And so he put two engines, one for each of the rear wheels, and that made him a little bit faster, and uh, he won a few more races. Uh, he then went off on a tangent. He said, okay, if two is good, I'll put four wheels on and four engines. That did not work. Undaunted, he developed the Type 2. He took it to the 1901 International Exposition in Milan. Ettore's innovative car captured the City Cup and a special medal from the Automobile Club of France. 
It also landed him a seven-year contract with a D. Dietrich Motor Company. He soon discovered that working in a factory was not for him. He was interested in the design process, not manufacturing. Bugatti left de Dietrich and moved through a succession of design and engineering jobs. He continued designing cars for himself. Eventually, he developed a car that he thought he could manufacture on his own, the Type 10. He found an abandoned dye works in the Alsatian town Molsheim and approached the local bank for funding. The banker's two sons were avid car buffs and the deal was done. He had a new car and a factory, but he needed to promote his enterprise. Since racing was the primary way car companies promoted their cars, he decided to build the finest racing machines the world had ever seen. In 1911, Ettore entered his modified Type 13 in the French Grand Prix. The 1911 event uh, was really remarkable. People had never seen uh, such a tiny little car perform so, so brilliantly. His design, his concept was small engine, high revving in a small car, lightweight. So he had a good power to weight ratio, which is what determines speed. The other car manufacturers had huge engines, uh, four or five times the size of the Bugatti engine. And one of his original cars came in second against these monsters and second place was fantastic and orders started pouring in. The racing publicity led to more sales, the factory expanded and more workers were hired. Ettore kept improving on his designs, producing a 100 horsepower race car called the Type 18. It's been described as the first uh, super sports car. Uh, and the, probably the most famous example is, is Black Bess. Black Bess was owned and driven by a woman, Ivy Cummings. She became known for her daring and skill. In 1914, World War I began and Bugatti's factory on the border of Germany was in the center of the dangerous turmoil. It wasn't safe for Bugatti to stay in Morsheim. He buried three of the four new race cars he'd been building. He crammed his wife and two kids into the one remaining car and drove off to the safety of Milan. During the war, Ettore developed a design for a revolutionary airplane engine that would allow a machine gun to fire through the propellers. After the war, Ettore and his family moved back to Molsheim and started to rebuild the Bugatti car company. One of his first jobs was to dig up the cars he'd hidden from the Germans. He rebuilt them and started to race. In 1920, one of these Bugatti Type 13s won the first Grand Prix held at Le Mans. In 1921, at Brescia, Bugattis came in first, second, third, and fourth. This unprecedented showing earned the car the nickname Brescia. Bugatti's road cars were often raced by wealthy owners. Their winning streaks meant Bugatti's won hundreds of races. He produced and was famous for producing racing cars. It was unusual for a racing car manufacturer, manufacturer to sell the racing cars to outside customers, but Bugatti did that. So you were encouraged to see the racing car that was famous, uh, maybe a part of the works team on the track at Monaco or somewhere, you could go and buy one of those. In 1924, supercharging engines was becoming the rage, but Bugatti objected to their use. He thought it was a shortcut that a good engineer should avoid. To compete with the supercharged cars, Ettore used his creativity 
to develop the very fast Type 35. In addition to a new engine and streamlined body, it featured what would become a signature design element, the horseshoe-shaped radiator. This reminded some of the designs of Ettore's father, Carlo. The new model was ready for the Grand Prix at Lyon, France, in 1924. These cars were spectacular. They were fast, zero to 60 in a little over six seconds, a top speed of nearly 125 miles an hour. Today, that may not seem like much, but in the 1920s, that was a supercar. But in 1926, his new touring car, the Type 40, wasn't fast and it wasn't very good looking. Bugatti asked his 18-year-old son, Jean, to work on its design. He created a body for his sister's car. Like his father and grandfather, Jean was an artist. Jean's talent for design earned him a place in the family business. But he didn't start at the top. His job was to learn about building cars. And Jean Bugatti went into the factory, just like all of the other workers from Molsheim. So he learned the skills of building cars right there in the Bugatti factory. Jean was happy to learn all about the car business, but his real dream was to race. His father knew how dangerous racing was and would not allow him to compete. Atori had lost his beloved brother to suicide and couldn't bear the thought of losing his son. Jean ignored his father and secretly started his own speed runs. He raced his Type 43 between Molsheim and Paris, where he would meet showgirls for a night out on the town and then race home. On the track, Bugattis were losing to supercharged cars. Ettore re-evaluated his opposition to this technology and added a supercharger. In 1929, Bugatti offered superchargers for his Type 35, creating a lightweight 140 horsepower car that was poised to win races. The newly supercharged Bugatti Type 35s took first and second places at Monaco that year. He was back in the winner's circle. Racing wins sold cars, but Bugatti also used the personal touch to sell his expensive models. He would invite prospective buyers to his estate, put them up in a guest house, and over a long weekend of hunting, dining, and relaxing, convince them that his were the greatest cars in the world. One guest suggested Bugatti didn't really have a car for her. She didn't want a race car, she wanted a grand luxury car. He went over his designs and started to put together the design of the grandest luxury car ever built, the Royale. The extravagant Type 41 Royale was meant to be a car for kings, the largest, most powerful car ever created. Six prototypes were made, several with bodies designed by Jean. And in Bugatti fashion, it was not just to be any big car, it was to be the biggest car, the most luxurious car, uh, the fastest high-speed grand touring car, suitable for royalty. And that's from whence the name was derived, the Royale. Ettore paid homage to his brother, Rembrandt, by placing a copy of one of his animal figures, the standing elephant, on the radiator of every royale. Unfortunately, only two royales were ever sold by Bugatti. They were too ostentatious for a world mired in an economic depression. Today, these six cars sell for 15 to 20 million dollars each. Their magnificent custom bodies further established Jean's reputation as a designer and helped to secure the Bugatti larger-than-life legend. While Atori was stalled in the luxury car trade, his race teams were still winning. In 1930, French driver René Dreyfus won the Monaco Grand Prix in a Type 35B, yet another variation of the most popular Bugatti racing model. 
Bugatti was still on top, but other manufacturers were catching up. He needed a more powerful engine to stay in the race. In 1931, the twin-cam eight-cylinder Type 51 took first, third, and fourth at Monaco. Bugatti had succeeded in building the best race cars in the world. He followed up by producing a series of winning cars, including the 300-horsepower four-wheel drive Type 53, its two-wheel drive cousin, the Type 54, as well as the Type 55 sports car. But Bugatti didn't have the resources to continue to compete against new cars coming out of Germany. Mercedes-Benz and Auto Union were building futuristic cars with the help of government subsidies that far surpassed anything Bugatti could build. He had to concentrate on attention-getting road cars. In 1934, when the Type 57 touring car was unveiled, it became the most popular Bugatti ever produced. One year later, three Type 57 SC Atlantics were built with customized bodywork by Jean. These cars showed off the pure artistry of Bugatti. The aviation-inspired riveted fenders and streamlined design was unique. These cars are coveted by collectors, like Ralph Lauren, whose restored Atlantic has won prizes at prestigious car shows. Uh, it's interesting that uh, amongst Bugatti owners, there, there are a lot of uh, people who are interested in other visual arts, so artists and architects and people who are interested in style and so on, are fascinated by Bugatti. A Tory had truly lived up to his heritage and proved that automobiles could be as beautiful as they were fast. While building his cars, a Tory had created a dynasty in the small French province around his factory but his kingdom was about to collapse. Bugatti had always felt that his workers were extended family. Uh, and historically, in the middle of the 1930s, unionization, standards of wages, standards for vacation and benefits started to spread in France. And much to his dismay, uh, some of his workers, not all of them, some of his workers decided that they wanted to have their own union, and Bugatti was against the union. The workers won their union, a crushing blow to Ettore. Ettore felt betrayed by the, the workforce who uh, were unhappy with his methods, and he spent more time away from Maltzheim and left the running of the factory to his son, Jean. Ettore moved to Paris and began to concentrate on designing new products, anything that moved, like a bicycle, a boat, an airplane, and a high-speed train. Everything had that special Bugatti flair. It was one of the most creative periods of his life. While Ettore was busy in Paris, Jean was trying to build cars that could compete with the high-powered German products of Mercedes and Outer Union. In 1939, two Bugatti factory team drivers showed that while the Germans owned Grand Prix racing, they could still be beaten. They outdrove Outer Union and Mercedes and captured a victory at Le Mans in a Type 57G. It gave the team hope. There was one last race of the year. It was on a seacoast town in France. And uh, Jean was testing one of the cars that had run at Le Mans. And the factory driver was not available to test the car. So one evening, Jean took the car out and they used a road near Dorillesheim back to Molsheim um, uh, that was several kilometers long and that was sort of their private test track. Jean relished these moments when he could push a car to its limits, much as he had done as a young man racing to Paris for his dates with showgirls. But he was not alone on the road that day. An inebriated postman insisted 
on getting out onto the track, getting out on, and riding his bicycle down that road. He had been cautioned, we have a car out there, it's going fast, it's dangerous. The guy forced his way onto the road. Jean Bugatti came around a corner, came over a, an incline, and when he got over it, there was the guy on the bicycle. He tried to avoid the postman. Jean swerved and struck a pear tree that dissected the car front to back. The 30-year-old was killed instantly. The postman lived. One month later, World War II started, and once again, the Germans took over the factory. When the war ended in 1945, Bugatti was ready to get back to work. The French government refused to return his factory. It said, as an Italian citizen, a recent enemy, he was not entitled. A Tory appealed the decision, and after pleading his case, he visited the rundown factory and the site where his son had died. And Ettore had kept one of the Royales. One of the Royales that did not sell was his everyday car. And he had a chauffeur. And uh, after they had made their presentation at the appeals court, he said to his chauffeur, hey, let's go look at Molsheim. And, and the chauffeur took him back to the factory. He couldn't get inside but he was able to see the place where Jean had had his accident and died. He was able to see Molsheim, a very traumatic experience. Ettore collapsed. His chauffeur picked him up and put him in the Royale, and they drove back to Paris. Bugatti fell into a coma. In August of 1947, he died, never knowing that the appeals court had returned his factory. Others tried to keep the factory going and produce cars that would keep the legend alive. The last car built on a new Bugatti chassis was completed in 1965 by Gear for the former head of Chrysler's design department, Virgil Exner. It was seen at the Turin Motor Show in 1966 and then faded into history. Others tried to revive the name. In the early 1990s, a group of engineers and designers was assembled to create a new Bugatti. The EB110 was a beautiful car, but the cost of sustaining this effort was too much. The company collapsed. The Bugatti name was again revived in 1998 when Volkswagen acquired the rights. Its often delayed Veyron is a striking and powerful car with a proposed $1 million plus price tag. The name Bugatti conjures up visions of racing excellence and of luxurious classic automobiles that are larger than life. The Bugatti legend is intact, even if a new car never makes it to market. These timeless cars are still taken out to race by avid fans. They're a reminder of a time when art and science combined to produce beautiful cars. Bugattis are thoroughbreds. Bugattis have the history of winning all these races. Bugattis are beautiful to the eye, whether they are standing still or going by at 100 miles an hour. For aficionados, nothing will ever compare with the artistry of the magnificent cars created by Ettore Bugatti.